All right, we are going to go ahead and get started um, and want to say a big welcome and thank you for coming to our session today, Crafting Your Story for Impact and Action with Sue Sheridan. We're really excited about this session. And before we pass it to Sue and jump in, just a few quick housekeeping things to go over. Um, click the globe interpretation icon to select your language. It should be at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and you can either select English or Spanish for today's session. Um, and then if you would like to enable closed captioning, just click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I believe everybody is currently on mute. Um, and we're just asking people to um, remain muted just to avoid interruptions to the presentation. We'll definitely have plenty of time at the end for people to come off mute and ask questions or put them in the chat. Um, but during the presentation, if you can stay muted, that would be very helpful. Um, and feel free to use the chat, please, um, for comments or reactions. Uh, and then you can also use the Zoom Q&A button um, to ask any questions that you have. Um, and a quick review of our practice agreements, um, which I believe if you have been to a Caregiver Summit earlier session, you have seen, um, but our sort of group practice agreements um, for gatherings are be present and accountable, be brave, be inclusive, take space and make space, and address racially biased systems and norms. And with that, I am going to pass it over to our fabulous speaker for today, Sue Sheridan. Great. Well, um, first of all, welcome from, let's see, I'm beaming in from the mountains of Idaho, where it has been snowing all week. Um, so greetings to all of you, wherever you are. And um, do you want to go to the next slide, please? Um, so I just want to tell you, oh, okay. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm Sue Sheridan. I am co-founder of Patients for Patient Safety US. We are a chapter of the World Health Organization or the WHO's Patient for for, Patients for Patient Safety program globally. And, you know, one of the reasons that um, we're going to be talking about storytelling is that the WHO is actually in the process of finalizing and will be publishing shortly a, um, a patient storytelling toolkit, which um, I'm taking a lot of that content, although it's not published, I was the developer of, her, of it. So I'm taking a lot of that content and sharing it with you um, today. Um, I also want to share that um, this quote by Annette Simmons, the right story told at the right time has the power to persuade, promote empathy, and provoke action. A story explains who you are, what you want, and why it matters. Now, this came from a book called Whoever tells the best story wins. It's a great book if you really want to perfect your storytelling. And, um, you know, another thing about stories is um, we as caregivers and patients and family members really have the power of storytelling. We have the lived experience. Uh, we know the what ifs in our heads that we're going to, that I'm going to talk about. And we really can leverage this. You know, our policymakers don't have, well, most of the policies don't have policymakers don't have the lived experience that we have. And so we really have to take the advantage of that opportunity. And let me say that prior, you know, um, I'm going to share about events in my life, but during that time, I have worked with the federal government at a federally funded research institute, as well as centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And I can tell you, working in the system, there is nothing more powerful to policymakers, researchers, and decision makers than the patient story. You know, we might not always know that, but I can tell you from experience working in the system that when patients tell their stories, although they may not get a lot of feedback, people would go back to their desk and talk about those stories for a long time. And we would integrate that into the policies and research that we did. So know that, you know, the stories that, that you will be crafting and sharing are vitally important to our leaders. 
You can go to the next slide. So what brings me here? So what brings me here are, is, is several events, but you see my late husband, Pat, and my son, Cal. You can see him on the scooter now um, at 29 years of age. Um, Cal was harmed when he was five days old when he was in a hospital. His newborn jaundice never got tested or treated in time. He suffered brain damage before our eyes in the hospital. And the result of that is he has pretty severe cerebral palsy, hearing impaired, speech impaired, mobility impaired. Um, he has lifetime cha challenges because of some diagnostic errors. And because of Cal, I've also been a lifetime caregiver. You see Cal's dad, my late husband, Pat, who four years after Cal's harm, um, also experienced a diagnostic error where a malignant pathology of a tumor never got communicated to his surgeon or to us. That tumor grew throughout his spinal cord and penetrated his spinal cord. And um, so that resulted in Pat getting seven surgeries. Basically, they took out his final, uh, his final column, replaced it with titanium, uh, radiation chemotherapy. He also ended up with severe disabilities. Um, at first, he became paralyzed from his waist down and then from his neck down. So I was a caregiver to both Cal and Pat that overlapped for three years. And during that time, it was a miracle, but we had a baby girl. So I was also, you know, full-time mom and caregiver to two very disabled family members. So, you know, that led me on a path. Now my advocacy actually um, went down a different path for advocating for safer care, but I lived the life of a caregiver. And quite frankly, this was in 2000 when I really uh, you know, really got vocal about care. I don't think the caregiver perspective or even acknowledging the work that we did was even on the radar back in 2000. I might be wrong because I haven't been as exposed to all of you in the caregiver community. Um, so let me, let me, so, you know, the fact that I didn't go on, although I talked about giving me a caregiver, I really didn't get into advocacy, but I did about changing our healthcare system to make it safer. So what I want to do is share with you, we can go to the next slide, um, my journey and other mothers' journeys of changing how jaundice in newborn is managed in the United States. And we did that through storytelling. So after my son's harm, I learned that this was actually happening to many babies across the United States to all um, slices of um, patients and families and and different from different geographic areas. So we moms got together. There were only seven of us that started out. And what we recognized is that none of our babies got tested for their jaundice levels before they let, left the hospital. So our advocacy was to make sure we changed the policy in the United States. Two things. We wanted to make sure that every baby in the United States was tested for their jaundice before they left the hospital. And we also wanted to make sure that we changed the parent education materials that prior to this group, it didn't say, you know, the CDC, the American Academy of Pediatrics, nothing mentioned the dangers of jaundice. And we thought that was really um, deceptive in a way. So we, that was our, we had two, our mission had two goals. And so we moms learn how to tell our stories very briefly. And also in longer events. I mean, sometimes we were invited to speak at a conference for an hour. Sometimes we had 30 seconds with our Congress, um, with our senators and legislators. Um, sometimes we had five minutes. So we learned how to tell our stories through this what if mechanism where we thought about our story and we thought about what were the central key learning areas in our stories that we wanted to, to direct policymakers, researchers, and other decision makers. So, um, you know, over the course, uh, you know, we are at this for eight years, but over the course of eight years and through our story telling, we got the CDC to identify this as a, um, a public health issue. We work with HRQ and got research funding. You can see all these, the Joint Commission issued Sentinel event alerts, but through our story and only seven of us to start with, and then we grew, um, we were successful in changing the standard of care in the United States. You can go to the next slide. So when the seven moms and I were crafting our story, I mentioned that we're, we were using this kind of what if methodology, because as you know, as patients and family members, caregivers, 
you know, we all live with this. What if, um, you know, in the, in the terms of how care was delivered with Cal and my husband, I had a lot of what ifs. In Cal's case, well, it was what if all babies had been screened for their jaundice? What if Cal had been screened for his jaundice level? And that turned into a policy change. And so this, this, ter- this what if framework has been used now in research and policy making. Um, like I mentioned, we're creating this larger template um, for patients who experience poor quality care. But I, I, I edited the um, framework to that of, you know, for caregivers. And so um, it's a very concise kind of framework and it has worked for us and many others um, when they have 30 seconds, 60 seconds, five minutes or, or more. Um, but I just kind of walk, want to walk through this and then I'm going to fill in what I would have said as a caregiver um, when I was a caregiver for Cal and Pat. Um, the first is, you know, I didn't put this up there, but always express appreciation. You know, the listeners always want to know that you appreciate their time. So always appreciate their time or the, appreciate them listening to you. Um, and then describe who you are. So I would say I'm Sue Sheridan. Um, I live in the mountains of Idaho. Um, I belong to a mother's group called Parents of Infants and Children with Cranicurus. And then, so I would take this template and fill it out, you know, so I can practice this. The next question is, what is your lived experience and challenges in caregiving? So I would say, um, you know, I'm a caregiver for my husband, who's 43, who has cancer and has become disabled through all of his treatments, and as well as my four-year-old son, who um, was disabled, has cerebral palsy, and has, you know, many challenges. And I'm also a caregiver to a little um, one-year-old baby that, you know, together, you know, I, I'm caregiving all of them. Then I'd go into the next level. How does this impact you physically, emotionally, and financially? You know, I would say the way this impacts me is that there is no way that I could work taking care of three family members with such high demands. Um, physically, you know, it, it, it takes a physical toll on you when you're helping transfer your husband who's, who's you know, disa- or, uh, paralyzed from his waist down. With my son, Cal, he falls a lot. I tried to catch him once and I dislocated my shoulder. Emotionally, it goes without saying, I get exhausted. Um, and then going to the next question, what do you wish would happen to address your challenges and impact of caregiving? Now, this is the what if questions. This is what you tailor to your audience. My what ifs would have been, what if I could have gotten reimbursed for the caregiving that I get, gave to my son and my husband? There was no way that I could work and I want to be the caregiver. So how could I have, what if there were mechanisms or laws or payment models in place to reimburse me? What if there had been support for me, especially like on medication reconciliation? I was left, you know, on the wild blue yonder trying to figure out how to administer drugs to both my son and my husband every hour and not get that, not get it confused. I would say, what if there were policies and programs in place to provide me periodic respite at times so I wouldn't get so exhausted and emotionally drained. So those would be maybe my what if questions. And then my specific call to action to the audience, you know, I could say we need to establish, my call to you is to establish payment models that acknowledge the hard work of the caregivers and all the work that I do. So I don't have to worry about getting a job or getting a babysitter or others that I don't know to care for my family. I could call on researchers to say, researchers, um, we're calling for more money to direct to research to understand the caregiving community, understand our needs through research, and then let's make policies on top of that. So those calls to action might be to centers of Medicare and Medicaid. It might be to our states. It might be to our um, legislators. Um, so really, again, craft your message to your audience. But these what ifs, if you think about your story, you think about your caregiving and what you want changed, craft them into very specific what ifs that can address and drive policy research and changes. Next slide. So the lessons learned in Pathway, Pathways Forward. Again, know how to tell your story. 
be as specific as possible, focused and evidence-based. Now, I would say the two areas where, you know, when I was in the government and we would hear testimony, we would hear public comment, we would invite stories. I would say two of the derailers of a patient's story would be that they would kind of wander all over the story and never really get to the key learning points or the key policy points. So like I said, write, use that template and that's just a guide. There might be other points you wanna include in your story, but make sure you get to those what ifs. Um, when I say be evidence-based, if there's statistics about caregivers, if there's data and peer-reviewed journals about the challenges and the needs that you have, reference those because that gives you credibility in it speaking at the level that our policymakers, we're speaking to that world that they live in. Really know your ask. Don't just tell a sad story because a sad story will end at that. You have to have that clear ask of your audience. Now, where do you tell your story? I mean, craft this story so you're ready to tell it anywhere. So I would say be visible. If you have the time to blog, tweet, use social media, reach out to media for interviews, but put yourself out there. You need every chance you can to tell your story and, 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 um, and your asks for policymakers, researchers, and others. I would say monitor the websites of the policymakers that affect caregiving and the research institutes. Um, often they're calling for public comment and there's something I'm sure some of you are familiar, but there's something called the Federal Register that whenever our government is seeking input from patients, caregivers, family members, it has to go by law in the Federal Register. So I would say, you know, keep your eyes peeled on the Federal Register, visit websites who of, of you know, CMS, AHRQ, and other agencies that, you know, fund projects and develop um, research for, around caregiving. Um, I know that PCORI, you know, I, I worked at PCORI for the Patient Center Outcomes Research Institute for five years. We had a lot of funding around caregivers. So you might visit their website. Again, that's the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute known as PCORI. Apply to be in state and federal advisory committees. I mean, here in Idaho, we're a small state. We're called the flyover state, but we have committees for caregivers. So seek out, find out what is available in your, in your state. And also where are the federal advisory committees at the federal level? You know, apply to be on the, on the advisory committees and their technical expert panels. Government is always looking for people with lived experience around caregiving. And then last but not least, you know, what we moms did it, you know, with our children who suffered from jaundice, we flipped the model and we invited the policymakers to our table. So as an organization, as you create community and your, and your, um, your network, you know, band together and bring, invite policymakers to your, ta your table so you can tell your stories and your what ifs. Don't be afraid to do that um, because we did that and much to our surprise, policymakers came when we, we invited them to a workshop that we hosted. So um, I think more and more policymakers are, it's harder for them to do outreach, but it's much easier for them to accept invitations. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So here's the tips and techniques. Um, know the purpose and objectives of the event and your audience. So let's say you're invited to provide public comment by, let's say, the Centers of Medicare and Medicaid about caregiver, about caregiving. Know the purpose of it and the objectives of the event and know that now CMS is a policymaker. So here's another, you know, here's another um, pitfall that I see with patients that they might be invited to talk about their experience but they go to a certain, you know, uh, an agency or wherever they're invited to speak and they end up talking about, like at PCORI, we're a research institute and patients would provide public comment about um, safe medication, which is really an FDA issue. So we saw kind of a mismatch sometimes. So if you are invited by an agency or a group or legislators or whatever to talk, know the objectives and know your audience. 
Um, no, like I said before, know how much time is given to share your story. Another pitfall that patients, I have fallen into it, is that patients go beyond the time frame that they're allotted. And now when you're doing the elevator speech, if you're on the hill and you're doing, you know, hill visits to your senators and, and that, and then you run into the elevator, which that happens, make sure you have that framework in your mind. Who are you? Who do you care give for? What are your what ifs? What are your challenges? And what is your ask? You know, always kind of think through that. Um, so whether it's 30 seconds or an hour, know how much time you're given. Now, if you're invited to speak at, at, at let's say a conference, ask if there's a time, you know, a, 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 a timekeeper. Um, know that exactly and stay with them that you lose people if you go beyond that time. You well use the storytelling what if framework to write your story. Be familiar with word counts. And this is really helpful for me and others. Um, different lengths. For example, in English, when you write it out, 125 to 150 words per minute. Um, so if you have 60 seconds, that's like, that's not, that's, that might be 75 words. So, you know, really work on the length of your story. Practice with friends and family or community members to get feedback. Now, I'm going to show you a video of a mom giving a what if um, story. And, and I think it's our next slide. Um, but when we did that, we had uh, about 15 or 17 patients and family members, all with unique stories. Um, again, it was about the quality of care rather than caregiving. But what we did is we used a framework, that, that what if framework, and then the patients and family members got together. Now you can do this online. We, we had the luxury of doing it in person. And the patients and family members and caregivers all shared their story in front of each other. They used their cell phones to time the stories and the patients and family members gave feedback to the, to the patients. So they crafted their story down to 30 seconds that were powerful. And what we did is we had 15 patients on stage and each one of them back to back gave their what if story that drove our audience to action. You're just gonna see one example of this. We can go to the next slide. Okay, here's an example of Susie. Um, Susie lost, well, I'll let her tell the story then I'll tell, tell you what happened after that. Good morning. I'm Susie Beckin and I'm representing Kaiser Permanente. My son, Chad, experienced a diagnostic error. There was a lack of patient provider relationship and a failure by physicians to listen to my son in the diagnostic process. Chad was misdiagnosed three times in one year. He was ultimately diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer. At the age of 37, Chad died after 16 months of treatment and painful side effects. What if the proper tests were done initially for an accurate diagnosis and treatment initiated earlier? Then maybe he would have survived. So that one particular what if story. Now, we, you can see there's people behind Susie. This was the stage where we had like 15 patients telling their 30 second story. And um, it was in front of about 700 researchers. Now, what she just said, she could say, say in an elevator, in a taxi cab, um, but it got, it got right down to the fact that what if Chad had been tested for his colon cancer, um, despite the fact that he had all the classic signs of colon cancer, she mentioned that Chad was 37. So that her testimony, her, her 30 second story prompted researchers in the, in the audience to write a grant to research why younger people are not getting screened for colon cancer, even when they present with classic symptoms of colon cancer. So that one story prompted a, you know, several hundred thousand dollar research grant. 
And so that's just one example. And so think about how you as caregivers and what you're really striving for. What is your ask? How do you craft that and drive a policy just like Susie did right here? Next slide. Good morning. Oh. So, you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been titled an advocate for 28 years. And just last year, I changed my title. And my title is I'm an activist. And the reason being is that, you know, in healthcare, we've been asking and asking and talking about and talking about improving healthcare. And, um, you know, the patients from patient, patients for Patient Safety US, there's several hundred of us. Um, we are talking, tired of talking about it. We are now acting on it. And so that's why we call ourselves activists, but we resonate with this concept of positive activism. So what is there? There's actually literature on this. Um, positive activism is where we use the energy of our differences to motivate and inspire change. So we always look for the positive active, you know, the positive aspects of what we're really pushing for. We draw people in rather than push them away. We want them under our tent. So we craft our message that's welcoming, it's challenging, but we're saying, let's do this together. Um, we really don't call on other activists. We call on all people to take action. And it promotes the change makers, the stewards and the responsible patients and stakeholders to influence policy and practice. They're intended to make the world a better place for everyone. So this is how we kind of frame our activism approach. And, um, and so I encourage others to think about, you know, are you an advocate or are you an activist? And, uh, Neither is right or wrong. So let's go to the next slide. So how do we use our positive activism? So um, I just you know reflecting on you know, the various ways we can be activists. Um, so raising awareness is huge. You know what are the challenges and burdens of being a caregiver? Not enough is known about us. So raise awareness. Publish, you know, get together and write a paper. Um, present whenever you can. Host webinars. Um, create podcasts. Invite, you know, a specialist to come in and do podcasts with you. Write letters. And when I say write letters, never give up on the power of a well-written letter. And I want to share that, you know, the pick bombs that you saw earlier, you know, that was our first step out of the gate when we wrote letters telling our story. Then we wrote letters. Um, this was kind of like before Facebook and, you know, computers were just being used. So a well-written letter got the attention of, you know, leaders in our healthcare system. And we still write letters. And Patients for Patient Safety US, you know, we wrote a letter to Secretary Becerra about, you know, improving healthcare. Well, we wrote the first time, we heard nothing. We wrote the second time, and we got a lot of organizations and other leaders to sign the letter. So we sent a second letter to Secretary Becerra, no response. We sent a third letter to Secretary Becerra, but this time we copied committee chair in Congress. We got a response from Secretary Becerra. So never give up on some of those really simple yet powerful advocacy and activism tools such as letter writing. Advocate for new funding policies and legislation via public comment. Now, this is something, I don't know how familiar you are with this, but all federal agencies that um, manage taxpayer dollars and spend our taxpayer dollars, they have to, by law, get public comment when they're making any changes or introducing any new bills or rulings about caregiving, about better care, et cetera. So again, go to the federal register. Um, it's difficult to digest because it's so... It's not written in our language, but um, seek out public comment. And maybe that's, you know, something that this organization could do is really seek out, you know, where are the opportunities for your public comment? When there's opportunities to testify, line up. Um, organize Hill Days and visit your elected officials. That is very powerful, either at your state level or at the federal level. Know what your asks are. And then organize, recruit, build capacity, and mobilize caregivers. Like I said, this whole you know um, webinar, learn how to tell your story. 
practice it in your mind. Know all the steps. Know your ask. Know your what ifs. Understand the healthcare system and the responsibilities of healthcare agencies. A lot of patients and caregivers I've seen in the past 20 years have made the mistake of going to the wrong agency asking for the wrong ask. So understand what healthcare agencies and organizations do and do not do. Okay, next slide. So that is the end of my presentation. I just totally believe in the power of all of you. Um, you do not have to be a policymaker to help create policy. Um, you do not need to be a researcher to help push the right kind of research you need. So believe in the spirit of the story. Believe in your what ifs as drivers of change. And um, boy, I just wish you all the luck. Best of luck. Okay, there's silence. Do you want me to keep talking? <laughs> Do we are we gonna answer questions or Sue? I actually have a question for you. Um, while we wait for other folks, if you want to put your questions in the chat, um, I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about social media and what you're seeing. Um, because I feel like every time I log into Instagram, I get a lot of like viral content and viral reels from caregivers talking about their stories, um, you know, using a lot of the principles that you've outlined here. And I always kind of wonder how, how does going viral on social media, like, does that translate into the kind of like policy change and recognition that, um, you know, you've seen like really make a difference in policies and practices. So I don't know, I would just love to hear some more of your thoughts on that. That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it because, you know, when the pick moms and I started out, there was no such thing as social media. So we had to do it the old fashioned way. Honestly, um, the first step out of the gates, though, was we created a listserv. And that was that back then was the only way to connect with other people. It grew exponentially, which was wonderful. So that was kind of our social media where clinicians engage, moms engage, policymakers engage. So it did bring us together. Now, when I worked in the government, specifically at Bacori and CMS, social media was very powerful. And so I'm so glad you brought this up. We followed everything. You know, we had a whole department dedicated to following social media about, you know, certain topics. And, you know, sometimes patient groups would um, actually kind of, um, you know, go too far and kind of attack us. So, you know, that's when you kind of lose the agency interest. And so I would say, remember that positive activism. Now, um, right now on um, like LinkedIn and, and now other platforms, threads, um, other, you know, TikTok, um, we're actually gonna be using social media about what ifs here in the near future. Um, so we're all kind of tiptoeing, if not tiptoeing, we're all in this space. And I think that I think the most important issue in when patients are telling their stories or caregivers are telling their stories. Now, if it's just a sad story, if it's just like, oh, this is awful, my life is so hard, I don't know what to do, nobody cares, that's important to communicate. But then in the, at the end of the story say, these are my needs. What if I have this? What if there was a policy for this? What if that? So I would really encourage some of those storytellers online is tell the sad part and don't, you know, don't sugarcoat it, but come up with some solutions as well. Um, you know, my group, Patients for Patient Safety US, we just um, hired a social media strategist. And so, you know, we're, we're getting more and more engaged on other platforms. Um, so I, I'm so glad you brought that up because it can be very powerful if done correctly. Because remember, you want to draw in your listeners who are going to change the policy and fund research and all that. So you want to be strategic and, you know, really kind of pull them in rather than pushing them away. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Appreciate your answer. And, you know, a lot of times another thing just about it's not really social media, although 
there are features of social media that helps with this. Let's say CMS comes out with a, a ruling about caregiving and let's say some payment models. Um, what's powerful about when our government asks for comment, it could be a 30, 60 second story with what ifs and a concrete ask is that um, you recruit other patients to put in the same comment. So by law, when I was at CMS, by law, the government has to take into account every comment made, even if it's the same comment made 200 times. And so remember that every voice counts when you're doing that. A lot of times when I see that public comment going on with patients and patient groups, I also see it happening in social media at the same time, really ginning up the, the energy and in, encouraging people to, to send this message. So I think there's a kind of a dual approach there. We have a question from Huba. Um, can you share an example of when, of where using your story may have made a big impact or a time that someone shared a story that made an impact on you or, or others around you? Um, well, first I would have to, I've seen lots of patient stories that have um, impacted policy and research. You know, I started with the pick moms where they directly influence getting research funded and we changed the policy on now all babies in the United States have to be tested for their jaundice. Um, you know, I've seen disease groups be very effective at um, medica cost of medication and to their storytelling and the, the burden of the cost of the medication and the impact to their family. Um, you know, there, there's, you know, you know, so many of the positive changes in our healthcare system, if you really dig, really comes from the influence of patients and families and caregivers. Um, so I would say that there's, you know, tremendous, you can go on our website as well, and you can see there's a lot of what if stories on pfps.us, um, and you can see a lot of great stories. Now at Bacori, we had uh, women influenced breast cancer screening, um, I'm not that familiar with the caregiving policies that have changed just because I haven't lived. I mean, I lived in that world, but I haven't been in the in the advocacy and activism world around caregivers. Oh, and then then what stories have influenced me? Um, I would say, you know, some of the most powerful stories that have impacted me in my work. Um, especially when I was out of the WHO for seven years, and especially those stories of the marginalized communities that typically don't have a big voice in policy, it really impacted me to hear how um, the burden of care caregiving or the burden of just unsafe uh, care impacted them. And so that really promoted and prompted us to give voice to those who we don't hear from very often. And that, that really impacted me. And that probably some of the most gratifying work that I've done to, um, and, and you know, nothing against men, but most of those voices were women and, um, and women in, in communities where women and, and cultures where women didn't have much of a voice. Um, so I would say that really influenced in policy and, and what we did at the WHO. I would, another example from that Susie Beckham story, you, you saw the other patients behind her. Um, there were a lot of stories of um, bias and discrimination and um, in healthcare. And those patient stories were, you know, the 30 second stories were remarkably um, powerful. And that also prompted um, funded research around how bias and discrimination impacts the outcomes of patients and family members. So again, very powerful stories ended up in very powerful uh, policy and research. And then um, I have a, a question. You gave great examples um, with tips and tricks. Um, is there anything that you would avoid either in preparing um, or, uh, you know, creating and crafting your uh, individual caregiver story? Yes. Um, 
I would avoid using um, names because I, I know that a lot of us carry some pretty rough stories and, and that there's, we might, we might um, want to point out either, you know, uh, an agency, a hospital, healthcare workers by name. And that is, that usually shuts down a story. And, you know, and especially if you want to tell it like at the Hill level or in front of policymakers, oftentimes they um, request you not to use names of institutions or finger pointing or blaming. And that's a very quick way to shut things down. So I would totally avoid that. I would not avoid emotion. Um, you heard Susie um, and uh, emotion means you care. And emotion really connects with the hearts and minds of our decision makers. So, you know, I would first ask yourself, are you ready to tell your story emotionally? Because sometimes people are still a little, you know, raw and, and that's okay. But, um, you know, when they're ready to tell the story, it's perfectly fine to show, to show this emotion because we are, we have to remind people we are all human beings. Oh, another thing to avoid when telling your story, something that has happened that kind of backfired is some patients were telling their stories, wonderful stories, but they use family member names and photos of them, and they did not have permission from their family members to do that. And so, um, so as a, you know, when I was in the policy making and research, we had to make sure that when patients were going to tell their story or public comment, that they either were not using any family, uh, any family names. Um, and if they were, we needed to know that they had permission to use their names. Oh, you know, I, I just keep thinking of what not to do. Um, and I'm just trying to think of the storytelling toolkit coming out of the WHO. Um, be culturally sensitive. You know, don't use jokes that are colorful or, you know, might um, appear to be discriminatory or insensitive to certain groups. You know, some people like to use humor and I see humor backfire a lot of the times. Um, humor is okay, but sometimes it, 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 it achieves the, uh, you know, uh, different um, effects that weren't desired. So, you know, the rough language, the, you know, crude jokes, the culturally insensitive um, remarks um, can really shut down a story. I'm leaving a little space before I start the closeout in case sure. anybody has any additional questions. Um, feel free to come off mute or put them in the chat or put them in the Whova chat. Um, so we'll leave another minute or so um, and then we'll close out. You know, as, as we wait for that minute, I'm just going to say that <clears throat> Some of the world leaders are relying on patient stories and caregiver stories. I mean, given the United Nations, the WHO is now collecting stories on how to better care for people globally. I mean, we have researchers, we have scientists now looking at the power of stories. So remember, I mean, we've got this asset, you know, we've really got this asset and now our global leaders are looking to us for these stories. Because as much research as we do, as much, you know, pontification we want from some healthcare leaders, they're realizing the power of a patient story or a consumer story or a caregiver story really captures the attention, the mind, the heart, and the action of those who are the listeners. Brianna, any other questions coming your way? We just got two more. Um, oh, good. Okay. We'll go with uh, the first one being, we all know caregivers are busy. How can we advocate and make a difference with the little time we have available? Yeah. Um, 
uh, I would say, you know, c connect. Now, this is a, this is a term that um, this is probably antiquated and inappropriate. But um, when we moms all found each other and we were caring for our disabled babies, I mean, we were like stretched super thin and um, we were working with a filmmaker. We created a film to really get our collective voices together. And the filmmaker was this young kind of hip, very artistic guy. And I showed him what we moms were doing. We were banding together. And so he said, he said, cool, you guys are tribing up. And so I use that language to say we are, we are getting together. We are creating our community. And um, collectively, we didn't have time to all do one thing, but collectively online, we could do a lot. And now with social media and you could create, I mean, when we created a video with all of our voices, that was probably one of the most powerful things that we did. And it didn't require us to fly to Washington, D.C., although we did. Um, you know, we created something that could be disseminated to, at conferences online. And so that was really, really our first step into being in the public eye because we created the voice of the moms. And we had video of our kids, and but we had our asks as well. And then the other question was, um, I'm an Alzheimer's caregiver. Would you recommend beginning my story, telling the journey under the umbrella of a large organization like ALZ organization or go solo? Uh, they both work. I think that, um, I think her story could be, I mean, her story is personal. And so I would say, you know, craft this very personal story. You can always say that she's part of the Alzheimer's, whatever it was, foundation or whatever it is. But the, the story herself is very personal. But to collect a lot of stories like hers would be powerful under the umbrella of the larger organization. Because I, I always talk about my personal stories, but I say I'm with either with Pitt or Patients for Patient Safety US, and that collectively we have many of these stories. And we're, we're a force together to establish our, our asks. And we all have the same asks. And that's another important thing that the message that you've got an army of caregivers asking for the same thing. I'm gonna give it a little longer because I would hate to cut anybody's question off. And I know sometimes it takes a minute to formulate it, so. You know, and I think your group is already doing this where you're kind of developing your ask, your asks. And um, that's where the power comes. You know, know the asks and, and rally around the one or two or maybe three asks. And don't try to boil the ocean, you know, really have these concrete laser focused asks. All right, if there are no other questions and please stop me if there are. Um, I will just say, Sue, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your work and your advocacy. And as somebody who is literally about to have a baby any day, I am exceedingly grateful um, for both your work and your advocacy. Um, and we are going to do a quick rejuvenation exercise um, before we close out, just recognizing that self-care for caregivers is so important um, and want to make sure we're giving people a chance to breathe and decompress in between sessions. Um, so find a comfortable way to position your body. You can sit, you can stand, you can lay down. Um, I recommend uh, being able to ground both of your feet into the floor if that's comfortable for you. Um, and if it's comfortable, close your eyes uh, and just take a really deep inhale through your nose if you can and then open your mouth and exhale through your mouth. Again, inhale and exhale 
And this time as you inhale, let your shoulders scrunch up towards your ears. And then as you exhale, let them slide down your back. And again, like that, inhale, shoulders towards your ears. Exhale, let your shoulders drop down your back. And then if you have space, let your arms kind of dangle down by your sides. And as you inhale, you're gonna sweep them out to the side and up, and then let them come to the center of your heart. And again, on an inhale, arms will drop down, wide to the side and up, and then come through the center of your heart. And one more time, arms drop down to your sides, take them out and up and pause at the top. If you'd like to add a little side stretch, take a hold of your right wrist with your left hand and just gently lean to your left. And then come on back up, take a hold of your left wrist with your right hand and gently lean to your right. And come on back up and then let your hands just rest comfortably in your lap. And we'll do one more biggest inhale you've taken all day in through your nose if you can and then out through your mouth. <laughs> Excellent. Um, and thank you everybody so much for attending this session. Thank you again um, to Sue uh, and make sure you give your feedback by reading this session, which you can do um, by clicking the rate session button um, which you can find directly underneath the session title. And with that, uh, we will close out and just thank everybody for coming and hope you have a great rest of your caregiver summit and a great rest of your day.